by show of hands, how many of you have either seen me before or this is your first time? <laughs> Some of you will get that later. That's okay. Um, I'm not that important, um, but my name is Jonathan Kirk. Uh, I grew up here in Greene County, went to West Green. In fact, Jesse and I used to play hangman and tic-tac-toe in the front pew of uh, Bible's Chapel while Donnie tried to preach. And... Um, I did so faithfully week after week until uh, he realized that we weren't taking notes and then separated us. But Jesse is truly one of my oldest friends, and I have uh, been honored this morning to have been asked to come and preach and bring the word uh, to you guys this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, I believe showing up to church without a Bible is kind of like showing up to lunch without your teeth. You can kind of get nibble around on it, but you can't really dig in. And if you don't have a Bible, then please see me after, uh, after a gathering this morning. I would love to make sure that you go home with one. Um, so Romans chapter 8 is where we'll be turning this morning. And while you're finding that, I want to let you know that I have an agenda this morning, that there is an agenda. Um, I actually want to convince you that COVID-19 was designed, that, that it was um, built for a purpose and then allowed into our country to achieve a, a very specific goal. Now, before the elders like, come and like, escort me off stage, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I'm not uh, talking about a government or a secret society or, or any political figure. Now, what I, what I want to say this morning, what Paul is going to teach us out of the book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, applies to all suffering. And all suffering has a purpose, it has a plan, it has a design. And, and with all jokes aside, my ultimate goal this morning, and what an amazing song to kind of set this up, my ultimate goal this morning is to put some ballast in your boat. Ballast is, is like the, the heavy stuff that goes at the bottom of the boat to keep it from capsizing. And so um, I know in a landlocked state, we don't have a whole lot of shipwright, uh, shipwrights in the room, so I thought that might be, need to be explained. But we, what I want to do this morning, I want to go over just some realities that are, that are heavy. They're weighty, okay? And I know that, but that's by design so that they can become ballast in your boat this morning so that when you face the storms of life that aren't over just because 2020 is over, right? I don't know if you knew this, but there was suffering around way before 2020. But I want to put some ballast in your boat so that when the storms of life come, we can, we can not capsize, but instead continue standing firm in our faith like oaks of righteousness planted by streams of living water. And so if you're there already, uh, look with me now at Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to read these 12 verses and then we'll jump right in. We'll dissect them together this morning. Five truths that I want us to see in these verses, and I'll go back and point them out after we read them. 18, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18, going through verse 30. For I consider that the sufferings, there's our word, of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we, don't, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those whom he called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. So five things quickly this morning. And and honestly, this could be five different sermons in and of themselves. But since I've got one Sunday and I'm really not sure what will ask me to preach again, I'm just going to give it all to you this morning. So get comfortable. It's about five or six hours and we'll be out of here, you know, uh, before dinner time. I promise. Um, Now, just quickly, I want to give these to you just kind of for for your consideration. uh, Five realities out of here that are all related to suffering. And uh, and if you have a pencil, uh, I I believe the shortest pencil is still longer than the longest mine. So if you have a chance to write this down uh, and look at it later, then that would be wonderful. Um, because I don't have time to really give each of these the, the proper um, time that it really, they really deserve. But five truths, they all start with the letter S, because that's the way I learned to do it while I was playing tic-tac-toe. And they all start with the letter S, and the first one is sovereignty. All suffering is governed by God's sovereignty. Now, a sovereign, a sovereign nation means that it has complete autonomous rule, right? A sovereign of a king, a ruler. When we say God has sovereignty, we mean that he is in complete and utter control of all of his creation, of all of his realm. And so all suffering is governed by God's sovereignty. And you can see it here as we get into these verses. It says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. So, so there, was, there was something going on at the beginning where the world was created, and we're, we're doing this right now with our daughters. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and it was good. It was perfect. There, was nothing, there weren't thorns, thistles, death, disease, sickness, danger. The, all of these things were not present at the beginning because God created it perfectly, and he upheld everything by, by the power of his sustaining hand uh, with complete and utter control over all of his creation. And, and then we decided that we, we wanted to take wisdom for ourselves. God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Rely on me for your wisdom, for, for what, how to define good and evil. But Adam and Eve decided, our first parents, decided that they wanted to define good and evil for themselves. So they reached and they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, rejecting God, sticking the little finger to God and saying, no, we will define for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And we are still doing that today. And God said, okay, if that's what, how you want to live, I will remove some of my sustaining power from this world, and I'll show you, I'll give you a glimpse of what life is like without me. And he cast them out of the garden, and now we have thorns and thistles, and we work hard by the sweat of our brow. Work wasn't the problem, but toil was introduced into the world. And, and now danger and disease and sickness and COVID-19 and threats of violence, and all these things are a result of us sticking our middle finger to God and saying, no, we reject you as our creator, and we will create a reality for ourselves. That, that's what happened when we rejected God. And God didn't remove his sovereignty, but he did remove some of his sustaining power. And then he subjected the world to this futility. Now, how, how do you know it's God? You, you may be asking. Well, first of all, the person who subjected this world to the futility, uh, to this danger, to this, this sword, um, to this disease, and all these things that come as a result of sin, it wasn't Satan. It wasn't Adam. Because look, look what the Bible says in verse 20. It says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, so whoever did this did it with a purpose, with a design, that, that there was a hope in doing this, that creation would then one day be set free from all of this corruption. Satan's not doing that. That was not Adam's intent. Paul is referring to God here. God is sovereign over all of our suffering. Because he's the one that subjected the world to the futility in the first place. And that's what the book of Job teaches us. If you don't have never read the book of Job, or if, if you've never, never met a man who's clinically depressed, it would be Job. Um, he, he lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his prosperity. He lost his family. And he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I can just imagine in that scene, because if you've read the book, you realize that at the very beginning, Satan is before God, and he's saying, uh, and God is saying to Satan, have you considered my, uh, my servant Job? Now, first of all, it would be amazing to get an accolade from God like that. But second of all, I, I, I honestly think I would rather God not bring my name up to Satan. Um, okay, because Satan then says, well, that's because you've protected him. You've not allowed me to harm him. And, and then Satan goes and he does all these things to Job. And Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I can imagine Satan somewhere going, no, the Lord gives and I take away. But Job recognizes that even Satan is on a leash, that he can't do anything unless God allows him to do that. And so ultimately it was God who gave and it was God who, who took away, and so God has not lost his sovereignty over his suffering. So all suffering is governed by God's sovereignty. One more quick point on this. All suffering, including people's sin against you, including people's sin against you, that is included in all suffering. I think the, this is most clearly seen in the life of Joseph. In the Old Testament, Joseph is betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, taken off to Egypt. He lives there. He's, uh, he's rejected by his brothers. He, he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown into jail, forgotten. Eventually, God raises him up to a place of leadership, and his brothers come back to Egypt in order to um, basically not starve to death. And he's there before his brothers, and he looks at his brothers, and he says this, probably the most profound words in the whole book of Genesis. He says, what you meant, what you purposed, what you planned, what you designed for evil, God meant it. He purposed it. He designed it. He planned it for good. Even the brother's sin against Joseph, God used and God was in control of. So all, so all suffering is governed by the sovereignty of our God. So let's, let's keep going here because that's not the only one. First one, sovereignty. Second one is sin. See, suffering demonstrates to us the seriousness of sin. Demonstrates to us the seriousness of sin. And this is what we were getting at when we were saying that he subjected the world to futility in hope, in hope that the world would be set free from this corruption. Because, you see, first and foremost, sin is not evil. It's not heinous. It, it, sin is not the biggest problem with sin. Is not that it hurts people. The biggest problem with sin is that it hurts God. That it is a, that it is a rejection of God. If you want to go back and read the first chapter of this book, um, chapter 1 of Romans explains to us that we have rejected God. We have traded His glory for lesser things. And that is the, the root of all sin. And he says that that is what incurs on us eternal wrath. See, if our sin was only against finite beings then our punishment would only be finite. We'd go to hell for a little while, and then we'd be done. But no, our sin is against e an eternal God, so now our punishment must fit the crime, and so our punishment will then be eternal. And so in order to show us the seriousness of our sin, God has removed some of that sustaining power, and now our whole world, the Bible says here, groans as if in the pains of childbirth to say, this isn't right. As we look around the world and we see people storming the gates of our capital and we see riots in our city streets and we witness a global pandemic, we look around and we, and in my own family, we've experienced death this year and, and, and many of you have been touched by that this year. And, and we look around and we look at it and we go, this isn't right. It shouldn't be this way. And what that is, is your soul crying out that, for the, that world that God created at, at the beginning, your soul knows that this isn't right, that the world shouldn't be this way. I think that reality hit me as a young pastor and, uh, and my first pastor at Real Life Church in West Virginia. It was at the, probably the end of my, um, for, I was at the end of my first year there, and um, there was a man uh, who, whose wife was uh, pregnant, and they were very excited, and um, I got a call before I went to bed that night, hey, water broke, we're going in to, um, 
to the hospital, and, uh, and, and you hopefully we'll have a baby in the morning. And I said, I said that's awesome. Let me know. We get a call about 1 a.m. in the morning, and I knew that wasn't good. Baby and mommy were both in trouble. And so I got dressed as fast as I could, drove up to the hospital. I'm sitting there in the waiting room with the family when the news came that um, mommy's in critical condition and the baby didn't make it. And so they took us all back to this little room where they brought out this um, this bassinet with this baby laying in it. And she was dressed, um, just looked still like a porcelain doll. And I remember the dad coming over and picking up his baby girl and sitting down next to me and just weeping and weeping. And I couldn't do anything but cry with him. I mean, that talk about really understanding what it means to weep with those who weep. And I didn't know uh, what to say. You don't, there's really nothing you can say in a moment like that. And, um, and I just remember him saying, why? 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 Over and over again. And eventually I had just enough wherewithal um, to just say the words, it's not supposed to be this way. And And he understood what I meant. That's all I really could say. And we just sat there and cried together some more. That's not the way this world is supposed to be. But moments like that remind us that this world is broken. And it causes us to groan, the Bible says. In the same way that a woman groans when she is. And we've had three, and I've been in there for all three. And there's some groaning going on. The same way that a woman groans in the pains of childbirth, the world is longing, longing to see us adopted. Because guess what? The world isn't going to change, and then we're being changed so that we can fit into that world. Here's what's amazing about these words. He says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. Wait, sorry, back up that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The glory belongs to us, to the children of God. And then the world will be changed so that it will be a good place for us. That's what God said. So this world is going to have to be changed in order to to fit into, uh, so that we will be able to, to live in it so that it will match the glory that we have when we are adopted and our bodies are finally redeemed from this corruption. But until then, we groan and we watch and we look at the world and all this suffering just reminds us that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Suffering demonstrates to us this seriousness of sin. But the opposite is also true. Because as the world be- begins to fall out beneath us and the storms of life come, not only is this world telling us that sin is serious, but it's reminding us that Jesus is sufficient. That's our third S. Sovereign sin, sufficiency of Christ. Look here. He starts it that way in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is an amazing theme in all of Paul's writings. He He writes elsewhere, he says, for for this light, momentary affliction, and when he writes those words, he's writing to Christians who are being burned at the stake for what they believe, and he calls it a light, momentary affliction. For this light, momentary affliction produces for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, as we fix our eyes not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, they're temporary, they're transient. But the things that are unseen, they're eternal. He says, listen, when you look around at this world and you begin to realize this isn't the way it's supposed to be, you begin to turn your eyes to something eternal. You begin to turn your eyes to Jesus and you begin to realize He is the one that's sufficient. See, my greatest hope in 2021 is not that COVID-19 will be over. My greatest hope in life is not that my suffering will end, but that my time with Jesus will begin. That should be your greatest hope because Jesus is sufficient. And if your hope is just that your suffering will end, then, then you'll, 
you'll be like this through your whole life as, as you go through a season of suffering, then it ends, and then you have nothing else to base your hope on. But no, Jesus is, is sufficient. See, Paul prayed three different times. He had, the Bible says that he had a messenger from Satan, again, just like Job. Satan was afflicting him, but he recognized this as a, a thorn in the flesh given to him by God, is what he called it. Again, Satan's the one inflicting him, but Paul's saying ultimately Satan can't do anything unless God allows him. So this is a, this is a thorn in my flesh from God, he called it. He says, three times I prayed. And I don't mean that, I don't think he bowed like three different times before a meal and asked God, please take this away. No, he, three different intense seasons of prayer, probably included in fasting, where he begged God to take this away from him. And what was God's answer? My grace is... Thank you, both of you. Sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. God doesn't always remove our suffering. Sometimes he just says, my grace is sufficient for you. Look to me, look to Jesus, and be comforted. Because my greatest hope in life is not that my suffering will end, but that my time with God will begin. And those two things together play into this fourth one here, um, that... that suffering leads toward my sanctification. Now, that, that's a fancy church word. It just means becoming more holy. It's, it's sanctification. You see, suffering leads toward sanctification because when you put those two realities together, beginning to realize the seriousness of sin, beginning to realize the depths of your sin, and then beginning to see the heights of God's glory and the sufficiency that is in Christ, you have a recipe for, forget, for sanctification. You, that's, that's really what sanctification is. You see, we have the depths of our glory, we have the, the, the depths of our sin, the heights of God's glory, and then it's the cross, it's Jesus that connects those two. And guess what? Our sin is against an infinite God, so it is, there is infinite depths to our sin, and there is infinite glory to God. We will spend eternity in heaven and never get bored of learning about who God is because he is infinite. That concept in math had to be defined, had to be invented in order to describe this reality about God. Infinite. And so there is an infinite growth of the cross as we continue to realize the depths of our sin and the heights of God's glory, and all eternity will be that. And this is where Paul is getting when, in these words, we've probably heard um, quoted before, he says, For we know that all things work together for good, those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How many of you have taken comfort in those words in this last year? Yeah, it's comforting. Let me tell you this. If you're going to use God's word, you also have to use God's definitions for his word as well. Because here's what I've realized. Sometimes we define good differently than God does. See, God doesn't define our good as our greatest amount of comfort. See, I, I've thought this way before about those words. Um, and, and you can be honest and, and just follow along with me in this train of thought. See if you've thought this way. Go out to your car, flat tire. Shoot, now you're frustrated, you're kicking the dirt. And you got to fix the tire. And, and, and down the road, you, you, God reminds you of this truth. So all things work together for good. Those love God and are called according to his purpose. And you think... I've thought before. Well, God probably saved me from some awful car wreck down the road. That because all things work together for good. So there was some purpose that God had for giving me the flat tire, and so I find some comfort in the fact that that God probably saved me from something worse down the road. God probably saved me from a car wreck. Has you ever thought that way? Well, when I re read the rest of these verses, I realized God doesn't define my good as my greatest amount of comfort. Look at how God defines your good. He says, verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. There's where we get the word sanctification. Becoming more like Jesus. That's God's goal for your life. Not your greatest amount of comfort. So guess what? When God is weighing whether he's going to bring a flat tire or a car wreck into your life, 
He doesn't define it by what's going to bring you the greatest amount of good. He says, what's going to make Mitchell look more like Jesus? What's going to make Sam look more like Jesus? So if we're going to use God's word, we also have to use God's definitions. Because God doesn't define our good as our greatest amount of comfort. He defines our good as us becoming more like Jesus. And God will, will allow suffering into your life for the purpose of showing you the depths of your sin, showing you the heights of the sufficiency of Christ and the glory of God, and letting the cross span that gap so that you can become more like Jesus and be sanctified. That is, that is how God defines your good. So the next time you have a car wreck or you have a flat tire, thank God we can rejoice in the suffering because we know that the glory that is to be revealed far surpasses whatever suffering we're experiencing right now. And last, not only is all suffering governed by the sovereignty of God, and all suffering demonstrates to us the seriousness of sin, and then demonstrates to us the sufficiency of Christ, and then leads towards our sanctification, but suffering itself is what provided the means of your salvation. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted God, you've never met God. My goal for you this morning is that you would just simply get a glimpse of this God that we worship and that you would be moved to worship him with us and that you would be saved this morning because, and, and what would cause that salvation, what would be the means of that salvation is suffering. Very specifically, the suffering of the Son of God. See, Jesus came as a man do not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, we learn, but gave it up so that he could take on the form of a servant and walk on this dusty ground. And Vince laid that out for us last week, right? So that he could save us. And it was that suffering as he walked. It was the suffering in the garden. It was the suffering on the cross as he hung there and suffocated to death, hanging from nails stuck through his wrists having to pull against them just to take a breath. It was that suffering that led to your salvation. For by his wounds, we are healed. Because that's the suffering that we deserve. We deserve to suffer in, in all the ways that we do and infinitely more. But Jesus, being great in loving kindness, while we were still sinners, died for us. He took the suffering upon himself. He took all the wrath of God. So that now, God doesn't have wrath towards us. He doesn't bring suffering into our lives as a mean of, means of punishing us. No, he poured out all the punishment on Christ. Now suffering just becomes a tool in his hands that he uses to mold us and shape us into the image of his son. And even death itself, for those who are in Christ, just becomes a taxi cab ride to heaven. He removes the sting of suffering. He removes the sting of sin. He removes the sting of death. And it was his suffering that did so. And we see God's sovereignty even at play in that because in Acts, the Bible says this, For truly in this city we're gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and plan had predestined to take place. God had not lost control as Jesus was being flogged. God had not lost control as Jesus was being hung on a cross. God was in complete control, and it was that suffering that brought us peace. It was that suffering that is the means now to our salvation. How much more should we suffer so that we might be like him and so that we might be with him for eternity? So this morning, I just want to put some ballast in your boat. 
I just want you to take these realities and let them sink into your soul and become a weight that holds you down against the storms of life so that you might be able to face whatever 2021 has to offer us because suffering is not over. It may take a different form, but we will continue to suffer in this life. But it has a purpose. For those of you who are in Christ, it has a design meant to sanctify you, meant to save you. And if you don't know this God who can even take someone's sin against you and use it for good, if you don't know him, I invite you to meet him this morning. Because he is good and he is powerful beyond belief. A couple words this morning as the band comes of application. First of all, let these truths change the way that you speak to God. Let them change the way you speak to God because it's not wrong. Paul did. Pray that this suffering will go away. Pray that COVID-19 will be over and we never have to hear the words again. Please do. But let that prayer be filled with faith and let that be prayer be rooted in the truth of knowing what suffering is actually all about. Because uh, I think one of the greatest stories uh, to teach us how to pray in faith is Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. The Bible says that um, they were to bow before Nebuchadnezzar and give, um, give him praise. And they said, we will not. We know that our God can deliver us. When face, being faced with thrown in the fiery furnace, they said, we know our God can deliver us. We believe that he will, but even if he doesn't, we'll still praise him. We're not bowing down. That's what the prayer of faith looks like. It's not, it's not believing with all of your heart that God will do this because God doesn't always answer the way that we ask. But it's knowing that he can. It's believing that he will and saying, even if he doesn't, we'll still praise him. So let these truths change the way you talk to God and let these truths change the way that you talk to others. The world around us, church, is longing for answers. And they're looking to us. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. Because the world needs this truth of who God is, that God is good, and God is in control, and God will save them. And He is so powerful, He can even use suffering, has even ordained that suffering be the means to that salvation. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we thank you for this reality that you've given us of suffering, bringing about our salvation and our sanctification and just being a tool in your hands that would lead us to see the depths of our sin and the heights of the sufficiency of Christ. And most of all, God, we're thankful for your sovereignty, that we do not have to walk around in fear because, God, you are in control and we can be thankful and we can know it is true. So God, lead us now in worship as we respond to you in song. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.